Um, to get us started, my name is Katie Bonner, and I'm an Associate Manager of Programs at the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers, which is the nonprofit organization that presents the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. Uh, today, I'm joined by a couple of my colleagues who are helping out with some tech support, just making sure that everything runs smoothly today. Uh, Hadel and Manny, do you want to introduce yourselves? Sure thing. Hi, everyone. My name is Jairo Enriquez, and I am the New York City Scholastic Awards Manager and an alum of the awards. Uh, hi, everyone. And my name is Manny Blasco. Uh, I'm a programs coordinator here at the Scholastic Awards. Um, I help support the region at large and New York City programs. Um, and I will also be here helping out with tech and any uh, questions that you have about the Scholastic Awards. If you want to drop in the chat, I can uh, help answer any questions. Thank you both. Um, and now, Dave and Katie, do you want to introduce yourselves as well, our illustrious presenters who will be leading most of today's session? Sure. Uh, my name is Dave Binkard. I'm an adjunct English instructor at the North Dakota State College of Science and North Dakota State University in Minnesota State Community and Technical College. And I've done a few workshops with uh, in alignment with Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. Hi everyone, my name is Katie Breidenbach. I am a high school English teacher and I teach ninth and 10th grade. And this past summer I collaborated with Dave on a um, grief and bereavement writing workshop specifically uh, using the anthology that we'll be talking a little bit more about today. Thank you everybody. Um, I'm sorry if you see me cast my eyes to the side. I have kind of a double screen setup going on, so I'm constantly losing track of my windows. Before I turn it back over to Katie and Dave for the bulk of today's session, I am just going to briefly introduce the Scholastic Awards and how it relates to this workshop topic. So some of you may already be familiar with the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards um, and some of the resources that we have available for students who are working on their entries now. But just to very briefly introduce us, uh, the mission of the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards is to identify students with exceptional artistic and literary talent and present their remarkable work to the world. This is done through a number of ways. Um, in the program, we start with the regional awards, which runs from September through December. Students who win the highest level of regional awards go on to be considered for national recognition. And that includes at both the regional and national ceremony, uh, level opportunities for ceremony and exhibition. Most regions host their own local exhibition. So you may have seen your students artwork displayed locally in the past. Um, this year, much of it has gone virtual as with everything. Uh, there are also usually regional ceremonies, whether they be online or in person. At the national level, we have a touring exhibition. Again, this year it's touring a little bit less than usual. Um, but usually it visits four places around the country, as well as a permanent installation in DC for a year. And um, a, mm, I believe months long exhibition here in New York City, which is where I'm located today. Um, and we have two anthologies that are published every year featuring student work, the best teen art of the year and the best teen writing of the year. And last but not least, there are of course scholarship opportunities available to students through the awards. The awards distributes more than $250,000 in direct scholarships each year, and that's in addition to recognition opportunities through colleges and universities directly. Many of them see the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards as a prerequisite for uh, merit-based scholarships at their school, especially ACAD institutions. So who is eligible to enter the Scholastic Awards? The awards are open to any students uh, located in the United States, a U.S. territory, a U.S. military base abroad, or in Canada in grades 7 through 12, ages 13 and above. Work is entered through our online portal. Everything is done online. You upload your work there. You access your entry form there. Sometimes you have to mail your entry form in. Sometimes you can upload it. Those particulars vary a bit by region, but again, everything is accessible online. There is a fee for participating. It's $7 for individual entries and $25 for portfolio entries, but fee waivers are available and we encourage any student for whom the fee poses a barrier to participation to use a fee waiver. The submissions don't open until September 1st. So you might wonder why we're talking about it now. 
Um, any works created this spring are eligible to be entered in next year's awards program. We know that for many of you in your classes or with the youth that you're working with, now is the time when they're producing the best work that they've created all year because they're at that growth point in their um, in your curriculum and their education. So we'll go over a few strategies at the end of our call today on how you can document work um, for students who are interested in participating in the Scholastic Awards next year. Again, submissions open September 1st and deadlines vary by region starting as early as December 1. So even though most students tend to enter the program between Thanksgiving and the first week in December, uh, it's never too early to get started. And we're always happy to see entries that come in around October, uh, which gives your students more time to prepare whatever they're working on now and make sure that it's up to snuff for what they feel comfortable sharing. Again, the program year follows um, kind of a roundabout, uh, just a general calendar. So students start creating original art and writing anytime, including now. They can enter their work in the fall. And right now we're preparing to celebrate our national medalists on the national scale. Um, but the main thing that we're talking about today is how the works that your students are creating this fall can be entered in the program. So there are 28 different categories of work that your students could enter their work in. There is no theme connected to any of these categories. Um, all judging is blind. They're all judged by the same criteria, which is originality, technical skill, and emergence of a personal vision or voice. The content is not um, really a part of what's being considered. So you might wonder how that creates to the Healing Through Creativity anthology and the guidebook. Well, there are several additional scholarships on top of the categories of work. So once your student picks a category that their work is eligible for, they enter their work in the program, they can opt in to be considered for one of several thematic scholarships, uh, which comes with cash awards as well. Amongst those thematic scholarships is the New York Life Award, which is sponsored by the New York Life Foundation. This particular award goes to work addressing personal grief and loss. So any student who is creating a piece of art or writing that deals with personal grief and loss can opt in to have their work considered for this award. On the national scale, there are $1,000 awards given out to six students each year and $250 awards given to their educators. And on the state scale, there are five states uh, where additional $500 awards are given out to two students. Again, the process to enter is the same. You create a work for the Scholastic Awards and during the entry process, you've opted to have your work considered. But if you're located in Michigan, Mississippi, Montana, New Jersey, or New Mexico, your student may be eligible for one of these two $500 scholarships that only go to students in your state whose work deals with personal grief and loss. Although the main point of today is to delve into these lesson plans that Dave and Katie have created to help support your students through processing grief, um, if your student creates something at the end of this process or if this opens the door for them where they feel really confident in the piece that they're creating and they feel comfortable sharing it with us, we would love to see it and they are invited to share it with the Scholastic Awards next fall. Listed on here are a few other thematic scholarships, um, each of which come with their own um, scholarship amount and their own um, prizes for educators. So I would encourage you to check those out. We have a few other resources available on our website as well. You can learn more about the scholarships at the link here. And you can find more about educator awards connected to different scholarships for students at the link here. Uh, both of those links are shared in the chat. So feel free to take a look at those at your leisure. And last but not least, some of the resources connected to our thematic scholarships. Uh, the one that we're going to be focusing on today is Healing Through Creativity. Healing Through Creativity is an anthology of works that students entered to the Scholastic Awards and opted in to have considered for the New York Life Award. They feature works that won the New York Life Award over the past few years. Um, and there are two accompanying guides for that, an Art Educator's Guide to Healing Through Creativity and the Writing Educator's Guide, which is what we'll be spending most of our time on today. You can also find some of our annual publications on our website, such as the Best Teen Writing and the Best Teen Art of each year and accompanying guides for those, as well as a series of prompts that were created at the beginning of quarantine last year by our national student poets. Um, that is called On Isolation, a series of poetry prompts and exercises on growth, healing, and crisis. 
You can find more resources, including the ones I mentioned here on the link that I just shared in the chat box. Uh, but I mentioned that one specifically because if you are looking for prompts that you can send your students home with, that specifically deal with the types of topics that we'll be talking about today, that is incredibly relevant. And now with that, Dave and Katie, I turn it over to you. Um, let me stop sharing if you want to take over. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen then. And then Dave is going to start us off with introducing uh, our Writers Educators Guide. Yeah, so what had happened is that last summer, uh, Katie and I worked with NDSU, uh, the NDSU branch to put together a uh, workshop for that uses this healing through creativity uh, guide. And the some of the lessons that we developed for that particular workshop, um, we were asked to develop them further so that they could be used in the classroom, uh, not just for students uh, who are experiencing grief and bereavement, but to design them in a way so that they'd be accessible to all students. Um, and with that, we've, we've got this guide here. Um, so we have a couple of goals um, that we wanted to meet. One was to support, to provide support to help people who use art as a springboard for experiencing feelings of loss. Now, whether that's visual art or uh, written work, um, we wanted to appeal to both because creativity is an excellent outlet for handling those feelings of grief and bereavement, feelings of loss. Um, and, you know, these are not easy topics to talk about. In a classroom, in private, um, they are difficult topics. So we, one of our goals, sorry, I got to put my cat down. As you guys can see, I've got this cat that ends, whenever I'm in class, she insists on being all over me. Okay. Um, so how we approach difficult experiences in everyday instruction. Um, these aren't the typical types of topics that are talked about or discussed in an actual classroom, but that doesn't mean that they don't deserve a presence in the classroom. These subjects can be an incredible source of creativity and can help us process these feelings in ways that, you know, we never thought imaginable. So, well, I, yeah. <laughs> I'll turn it over to Katie. All right, yeah. So to talk about those other two points that we see up on the screen, another way that we designed um, the lesson plans in our writer's guide was to have the works in the Healing Through Creativity anthology serve as mentor texts for students to use in the classroom. So within the Healing Through Creativity anthology, there's tons of examples of student work, all with phenomenal discussion questions to explore the themes of loss and grief. And within this writer's guide, um, we wanted to build off of that to make it more um, easily adaptable for the classroom. So one way to do that is to, like I said, use these works as mentor texts. So we created activities that engage students in reading like writers to notice the various techniques and writing moves that um, the authors of the works in the anthology utilize. And then students can use those mentor texts as inspiration to produce writing um, of their own. And uh, I think it's something that's very aspirational to study a piece of writing created by someone who is around your own age. And then additionally, um, you know, approaching these topics and the way that we created the lessons, we wanted to really create a space that allows students to bring their own life experiences into the classroom. Of course, students are experts in their own lives. So by centering their experiences, you're communicating that they are competent and that their presence is really valuable within your classroom um, and that they're able to actively contribute to their peers' learning. Um, 
It also allowing students to talk about their personal experiences, especially related to difficult subjects like grief and loss, really helps to create a culture and a sense of belonging within the classroom. So those were kind of the goals of uh, creating this writer's guide. So we are going to transition to talking about a few of the lessons um, that we created that are in the writer's guide. So starting off, Dave is going to talk about the memento narrative. All right, so the memento narrative is where students will write a personal narrative about a memento of significant personal value. When we lose someone or we've experienced loss of some kind, we typically have some sort of remainder or something that remains from that person, whether it's a photograph or a trinket or something along those lines. And these are objects that hold significant sentimental value to us. And we hold on to them uh, for life. And it's the type of object that, uh, you know, we stumble across every now and then, like uh, when you're cleaning out your basement or your room or something, you stumble across this, this memento and all of a sudden the floodgates of memories are opened up and it all comes back. So this exercise utilizes the healing through creativity works um, in loving memory and peace is only real in a photograph. These are works um, that appeared in that healing through creativity anthology who were put together by high school students. Um, so the project's goal is to allow students to explore how they interpret memories over the passage of time. When this memento, whatever it is, was first received, um, it had a certain value. As um, and memories, you know, age, um, the meaning of this memento changes accordingly. So one of the uh, one of the goals of this activity is to explore how the significance of this object can change over the passage of time. And with it, there are some learning outcomes like pacing, foreshadowing, and rich description. Um, this goal is to create a work of creative nonfiction, a personal narrative. Um, and with the lesson, um, as you go through it, you'll see how students can develop and hone their skills for peer reviewing and these other things. Uh, and it says that this lesson can be easily paired with other types of creative writing activities and lessons to help um, to help flesh out this this uh, interpretation of memories. Um, so as it says, this lesson appeals to students who are experiencing grief and bereavement as well as those who are not. Um, whether someone has lost someone um, significant to them or perhaps a best friend from childhood moves away and all you have left is the last object they gave you or something, um, students can easily bring in those mementos, those objects, and use them as a basis for this activity. Because students are likely to have something of significant personal value to them, um, whether it's a photograph or some sort of object. And as such, this lesson can be easily adapted for a wide variety of purposes. Um, the full activity guide is listed in, um, in the guide uh, that Katie had shared. All right, so next I'm going to talk about the My Elephant and Me digital gallery project. So if you have access to that link um, to the writer's Writing Educator's Guide, this starts on page 23 if you wanna go and look over it. But essentially what this mini unit um, asks students to do is students will go from learning what a metaphor is to analyzing the success of using a metaphor in their own writing. So starting off at that very bottom of learning and understanding all the way to critical analysis of something that students have created. Um, so this mini unit uses the mentor text, My Elephant and Me from the um, writing anthology. And in it, it is the story of a young girl who loses her baby brother. And she creates this extended metaphor 
for the grief that she's feeling using an elephant. Um, this grief was something that was always present with her, but something that she didn't feel like she could talk about, um, which kind of blends over into this idea of the elephant in the room. So what this mini unit asks students to do is use an extended metaphor to explore a time that they felt silenced, a time that they couldn't quite find the words to say for whatever reason, um, or to discuss a topic that should be talked about more, but feels, that, uh, feels like it is off limits in certain spaces. So this gives students the opportunity to reclaim their voices, to talk about feelings of loss, or to bring awareness to an issue that they believe deserves more attention, all while developing an extended metaphor throughout their writing. So still really going back to that standard. Um, and this again allows students who have experienced loss to talk about that, and students who have not experienced loss to then just talk about something that they're passionate about. So it is adaptable, adaptable to both groups of students. Um, in the educator's guide, there is also an idea to as to how this could be paired with a visual arts component, having students create in an art class or even within the English classroom, creating a visual representation of the metaphor that they are exploring throughout their writing. Um, so that is a little overview of two of the lessons that are in the guide. And for the third lesson that's in the writer's guide, we are going to be doing a sample activity. So I'm going to turn it over to Dave, who is going to introduce. Sometimes I feel like there is nothing left. All right. So for this activity, we would like you to participate. Um, and come up with your own writing response to this prompt. The prompt is to think about a time when you faced a difficult situation and you were not sure how to react. And how does this image depict this idea? Um, I'm gonna ask Katie, can you go to the next slide? I've got the picture a little bigger there. There it is. Okay, so as we can see this image, it's somebody standing in front of a vending machine. Along the side of it, it says, how do you feel? And the person, as you can see, has a hole in their chest or their torso where the light's shining through. It's, it's a little hard to read, but the objects uh, read, they have things like purpose or belonging or love. Um, So one of these abstract ideas is meant to fill in the hole. Um, but Katie, if you can go back to the, well, we'll leave it on this slide. Um, the prompt again is to think about a time when you faced a difficult situation and we're not sure how to react. So we'll give you a few minutes to write about that.
All right. Um, one of the goals of this particular lesson is to help provide students with the tools needed for that self introspection or that that introspection and self analysis that helps them understand what it is they're feeling. These are experiences and feelings that are hard to put into words. And it's hard to tell somebody, how do you feel? It's, it can be hard to answer that question um, when you're presented, well, when, it, when it comes up, when someone asks you, how do you feel? Well, the words might not be there. The feelings might not be there to adequately explain what it is that you are feeling. And not every student has access to the same resources to help them process these complex feelings. So hopefully with an activity like this, it will give them that chance to perform some self-analysis and look deep within themselves to try and put it into words how they feel, or at least to look at it in a new light that they hadn't previously. All right, uh, with that, I will turn it over to Katie. Yeah, so as you can see up on the screen now, we have a few discussion questions. These are uh, also listed in the Writing Educators Guide um, to go along with this activity. So we recommend engaging students in a discussion, critically analyzing the art. So we are going to talk through some of the questions right now. And then also just a note on um, the free writing activity that we just had you do. One thing that Dave and I found really powerful when we did the grief and bereavement writing workshop with students this summer was writing alongside students. So with each of the writing prompts that we gave them, we also wrote in response to them and um, were able to share our own experiences of grief and loss. And I think that helped create um, a safer space for students to also feel like they could be vulnerable with us. Um, so that is just something that I recommend doing even within your own classrooms is um, whenever possible, writing alongside with students so that you're able to kind of explore and make connections together. So with that being said, the first question um, that we have listed here is one of the central parts of this image is the hole in the middle of the person. Is there a hole in your life? So this question asks students to reflect on artistic choices made in the piece, um, but also to make connections in their own lives. Um, and discussing this as a class would serve as a brainstorming activity to get students thinking about their own experiences. So after this, you'll see the writing prompt um, that we would ask students to do in response to this. So being able to talk through um, the picture, critically analyze it and have students start making connections and talking through their own experiences, like I said, serves as a really great brainstorming activity. Um, likewise, question number two says, the vending machine has some interesting things for sale, such as love and purpose. What meaning does it create to have these things in the vending machine? So again, this is asking students to really zoom in on the details and think critically about artistic choices. Um, and this could lead to a conversation of what students would add, change, or do differently if they were the artist. Um, again, thinking critically about making choices, which will translate then into them um, creating their own art and writing. So with that, Dave, did you have anything else to add um, with those final two discussion questions? Yeah, um, so the next one reads, the side of the vending machine reads, how do you feel? And how does this impact the meaning of what is inside the vending machine? Well, when experiencing such powerful emotions as grief, bereavement, loss, things like love, purpose, meaning, uh, what it means to feel happy, um, those things, those ideas, those things that you once knew and you could, you could put into words, you could define them, they no longer have any meaning. What is love anymore? Um, so trying to answer this loaded question, it is a simple question, but it's also a loaded question. So this gets students to think more deeply about what exactly these different 
things mean to them, how their meaning has changed um, as a result of whatever it is that they've experienced. The final question is a, a very interesting look at analysis or a very interesting look at uh, social norms. And it reads that society seems to expect a generic answer to the question, how do you feel or how are you today? Well, have you ever been asked a question like this and you replied that you were good or fine when life was not good or fine for you? And why did you say that? And as a society, we do expect these stock answers. For instance, you break your arm, you go to the emergency room, the doctor walks in and says, how are you doing today? And you say, oh, I'm okay, even though your arm is broken. Why do we do this? Why do we say these things? Um, hearing it straight from the mouths of students in a discussion um, usually yields some interesting results. Um, as for why you've said you're good or fine when life is not good or fine. Um, uh, Camille says, we always say fine means freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotionally unstable. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So this question yields some very interesting answers. Um, and it changes as a result of experiences that we've had. Hey, Dave. Um, before we move on, we had a question from the chat. Yes. How could we deal with the feelings of students when they discover them in a virtual scenario? Well, when we discover them in a virtual scenario, um, I think it would be good to ask what, who the student has around them that they might be able to talk to. Um, if you've worked with the students for a length of time, you've probably gotten to know them and know if they have any support system. Um, I think it might also be good to document um, anything that you might have. For instance, as a personal experience that I have had, um, I teach dual credit high school classes. So uh, high school students taking college credit classes. And one student had emailed me essentially that they were feeling suicidal. So my first reaction was to contact the student's school um, and their, their counselor and let them know what it was that the student had sent me. Um, and thankfully nothing happened and the student seems to be doing better. Um, so being able to contact people um, is definitely, definitely a, a good thing to have, or it is good. And I'm glad that the student did reach out to me uh, with what they were going through because I was able to get them the help that they needed. They had told me that they were seeing a doctor, but whether that's actually true or not is hard to say. Um, so the student was able, was it seems that the student was able to get the help that they needed. Great, thank you. All right, so the nice thing about this activity, sometimes I feel like there's nothing left, is that it is also, um, it's also meant to be used in conjunction with art. Just like this image is abstract in the sense that there's a hole that needs to be filled. Um, one of the things that might come up with the discussion of whether someone truly is good or fine when asked that generic question, how do you feel? One of the things that might come up is that people put up a shield, a mask, uh, some sort of facade to disguise how they're truly feeling. Um, so one of the uh, pieces of artwork that can be used in conjunction with this assignment to produce visual art is an abstract representation of that. What does it mean to hide behind the shield? How can you display that in a work of art or to hide behind the shield to expose how you truly feel? Um, and the lesson plan does have some recommendations for uh, helping students come up with ideas for that. So in conjunction with it being a, uh, a piece of artwork, we, the lesson also includes um, 
having an additional poem to go with it. So the prompt reads, write a poem of four stanzas in length in which you were unsure of how to react in a difficult situation. How did you feel? How did you handle it? And to try to use more figurative and abstract language rather than concrete and literal language. Going along with this uh, activity would be a lesson plan in which those terms are defined and walked through with students. Uh, figurative and abstract language as well as concrete and literal language going through examples of which what means what and uh, examples, definitions, that sort of thing. So what I would like you guys to do is to pull out a sheet of digital paper and try your hand at writing a poem of four stanzas in length. How many lines in each stanza? Well, that's up to you. Um, but about a time that you were unsure of how to react in a difficult situation. So essentially, take what it was that you have written for the first writing prompt and carve out of it those key ideas that really stand out to you, those things that you've written that really resonate with you, that you want to explore more. Carve those words out, carve those phrases out, carve those sentences out, and use them as the basis of putting together this poem. So we'll give you some time to do that.
All right, I want to make sure that we have enough time for questions here at the end. So for whoever feels comfortable, we would like to encourage you to share um, your favorite line or your most powerful line in the chat. Um, and then we are going to move on to a debrief and an opportunity for any questions. So we'll take about one more minute of writing. Like I said, anyone who feels comfortable can go ahead and share their favorite line in the chat. And then we will debrief and have time for questions. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start our debrief. Again, if anyone wants to share a favorite line in the chat, um, I encourage you to do so. So hopefully throughout this presentation, um, we've already been able to show you how uh, the Healing Through Creativity Anthology and uh, Writing Educator's Guide could be used in the classroom and be relevant to students um, who have lost a loved one and also for those who have not. Um, but to reiterate some of our main points, uh, we both believe that, that, that it's really powerful to have students study these works as mentor texts to analyze them for the writing techniques and skills um, that students can then emulate in their own writing. And then I think even more importantly, by reading about grief and loss um, more in the classroom, it becomes normalized. And it gives students who have experienced uh, grief or loss the space to write about it and feel comfortable sharing about it, especially if as teachers we are modeling that vulnerability. It really opens it up to allow students to do the same. Um, also, a lot of the works can be zoomed out of just focusing on grief and loss to connect to broader themes of family, loneliness, inequality, emptiness, and so much more. Um, so I don't know if there's anything that Dave wants to add on to that, but otherwise we can open it up if anybody has any questions. I like what you said about normalizing it in the classroom. And it's amazing uh, the collective experiences that students have can really further the discussion of grief, bereavement, how to handle this, how to cope, how to grow, because in the end, that's the goal is to grow and develop and to come to terms with what it is we've experienced it and to look at it in a new and insightful way. Thank you both so much for that great um, walk through the lesson plan. I think that that was incredibly helpful. I'm gonna open up now for questions. Feel free to um, type in the chat box or speak aloud and take yourselves off mute. You know, actually before we jump into questions, Dave and Katie, would you mind just modeling, um, maybe take two minutes to model how you might respond to students sharing some of their work using the examples from the chat box. Absolutely. So um, 
I haven't been teaching virtually, we've been in person, but something that I liked to do um, during our online writing workshop was when students shared was to read over everything that they had shared in the chat. Um, so, and then giving um, positive feedback on what they had written. So for example, um, we had someone share, to be a good daughter is to smile when you bleed, serve blindly thy neighbor and curtsy all while dying in the absence of a father. So acknowledging what students are saying and then giving them um, positive feedback is how I would um, deal with this. And then if I had any personal connections, I would make them to what students had written and ask uh, anybody, any other students to um, contribute as well. Dave, anything else you would add to that? I want to stress. I want. <clears throat> I want to stress the positive affirmation. Um, writing about this stuff is not easy, and it takes a great deal of courage to put down on paper what it is you're really feeling inside. So, being able to um, positively affirm what it is the student has done can go miles in helping them. Um, if they experience the wrong type of criticism, then they're likely to, well, it's possible that they could, in a sense, shut down, um, not to pick up the pen or keyboard ever again. Um, so you wanna be careful with the type of feedback that you're giving. And what Katie had said um, is excellent. Would you mind sharing um, an example of a positive affirmation that you might give to a student in this case? Is it more directed towards their writing or the act of them sharing? It could be toward either one. Um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, Maggie had written, if you lose the game for us, that's okay too. My friend's uniform was dripping wet with worry. So in a, in something like this, a positive affirmation might be to, uh, to complement their use of abstract language, like in this case, the uniform dripping wet with worry, um, recognize that they've done something uh, quite interesting with using abstract language. The uniform's not actually dripping wet with worry, but we can get that that's the experience or the emotion that their teammate, their friend, is feeling in the moment. Um, and I think that's very creatively done. So that's a positive affirmation um, that would encourage them to keep going with what it is they're doing. Great, thank you all so much. Um, I wanna open it now. If anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box or take yourselves off mute. Hello, good evening. I, well, if most of my students are visual and I, I've had the situation where I ask, I constantly ask them, how are you today? And they say, fine, thank you. <laughs> the standardized uh, response. And I usually have to talk them out of that phrase and say, I'm actually asking how you are. And then they say, oh, I'm tired or I'm feeling stressed out. And then they speak a little bit more. Um, what would you suggest? I don't know if it's a question or an observation, but it could be both. Um, <laughs> what could you suge uh, suggest to do like a visual or a lesson to identify emotions? Because I have observed that most students do not know how to express, okay, I'm happy today, I am sad, I'm angry. They just say I'm tired. So if you can have maybe any feedback or any resources related to a, like a pre-lesson or pre-activity before doing this poem, which I love the activity, by the way. I have had a... a another teacher in my school um has like little emojis for emotions on post-it notes and it's like a warm-up activity and the students come in the classroom 
they kind of um, draw or they post, take a post-it note and they show it to her. So she kind of knows straight off the bat how they're feeling that day. And that kind of gives her a um, guideline as to how to proceed with the class. So that's not an in-depth activity, but it's just a quick barometer of, you know, what's going on with their emotional lives. And sometimes it can be quite helpful. Yeah. <clears throat> an idea I had uh, just now was that it would be to have them, um, I know you had said that they're more visual, but for creative writing, um, ask them to define how it is they're feeling today. Uh, if they can write out like a dictionary definition. I'm, I'm not sure what age group you're working with here, but that might be an interesting way to go about uh, having them kind of look deep into how they're feeling to actually define it as it would appear in a dictionary. They're 11th graders. Okay. Um, an activity that I've done with my students is I gave them a list of different emotions just because sometimes if students have a limited vocabulary, they might not really know the exact words um, to describe how they're feeling. So I gave them a list of emotions and then I had them write out describing that emotion without actually using the word. Um, which I found kind of helped them describe more what they were feeling rather than just giving a one word response. Thank you. I could add, we do a, an activity called a body map of feelings and it's like an outline of a body with then like 10 emotions and you color key them. So you put a color and then you fill in on the map, the body outline, like where you feel that emotion. And I found that can be super helpful because kids like, they can't say that they're anxious, but they know that their stomach hurts. And then when they see, you know, nervous and can color in that place in their stomach, that can help with identifying feelings. We have a question in the chat box from Steve. Uh, do you recommend that students do drafts or multiple revisions in doing art, especially fully rendered figurative visual art? Doing sketches helps the, the composition, but does that reduce the passion for younger students who might want to have a more raw reaction to the prompt? Um, some of the activities have built into them a peer review, um, but then again, some students might not be um, comfortable having their classmates read what it is they've written, especially if what they're writing deals with their classmates um, so the nice thing about these is that they can be adapted however you like. If you want to work in uh, multiple revisions or multiple drafts, you certainly can. Um, if you find a piece of work that a student has created that is particularly powerful but needs a little bit of refinement, it might work to talk to them one-on-one -on -one, um, and offer any... Uh, any feedback that you feel is necessary, um, as opposed to having everybody do multiple drafts or revisions. I guess too, I would say it depends on what your purpose or objective is. Um, like if you're just trying to focus on social emotional learning and um, having students express themselves, then I would say just having one um, draft would be fine. I know with uh, like writing, if we're focusing on a specific standard, then usually I will have students do multiple revisions and I'll give them feedback and I'll always um, talk about their strengths first. So things that I'm noticing that they're doing exceptionally well and then improvements and the improvements are very skill-based. So can you try to add more sensory language or can you try to um, vary your sentence structure, things like that? So instead of uh, feeling like I'm attacking their work or their story, it's more so looking at their skills so that um, they're still reaching towards whatever standard it is that we're working on. Yeah, great, thanks. I just want to be mindful of time. I'm sorry, I don't want to cut the conversation short. So I'm happy to hang out for a few more minutes. Um, Dave and Katie, I don't know if you have a few more minutes as well. If 
anyone, thank you. If anyone has some questions and wants to stay on, uh, but just very quickly before we go, in terms of next steps, if you have students that are interested in applying to the Scholastic Awards, um, there are a few things that you can do right now. And I will share my screen briefly with you. Um, so first up, you can save and document your students' work. If your students are artists, please take pictures of their artwork. Again, everything needs to be digitally uploaded and that's usually the hardest part for students. Uh, the feedback that we hear from jurors the most is that they need clear pictures of the work in order to judge it well. Um, if your students are writers, make sure that they are editing their work. Maybe they take a break over the summer and they come back with fresh eyes in the fall before entering it, but make sure that you have copy saved. Um, and of course, if your students are submitting a work related to personal grief and loss and they want to opt into the New York Life Award, they'll have to provide a brief personal statement. It just needs to be more than 50 words about um, the inspiration for their piece, what it means to them, and how it relates to their experience with grief and loss. If you are at all nervous about remembering this, we will remind you in the fall. You can sign up at the link here for an email reminder. And of course, come back and create an account. And if you have any questions for us at the Scholastic Awards or for Dave and Katie, please email ral at artandwriting.org. And we would be happy to get back to you and pass your emails along to Dave and Katie. Um, so again, that's ral at artandwriting.org. Uh, I see one question in the chat. Do we get a, a PD certificate for this training? No, we do not have certificates for this training, but we are happy to provide a letter certifying that you attended if that would be at all helpful. Thank you all so much for joining and for sharing during our practice sessions. Again, feel free to hang out if you have questions. You can take yourselves off mute or type them in the box or feel free to hop off. Thank you.